Hello friends, it's Mr. Nobody and I'm bringing you another great literature reading. And today we're going to be reading King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table. Um, the stories by Robert La Roger Lancelin Green. Now, uh, in case you aren't familiar with this, King Arthur, famous <laughs> legendary King of England, Sword in the Stone, uh, all, all of that. And I'm just going to read three selections, which I think are sort of key moments, key selections. If you're familiar with the basic story of King Arthur, maybe you've at least seen the Disney movie, so you know there's a boy called Arthur, he pulls the sword out of the stone. It's a lot more complicated than that, but I'm going to read you three selections, one of which deals with what happened to Merlin, um, and then some later events that set up the final uh, ending of the, the Arthur Legendarium. So, <sighs> Chapter 4, The Magic of Nimue and Morgana Le Fay. On the day following the Feast of Pentecost, on which the round table was set up in Camelot, King Arthur rode alone in the forest, sorrowing for the strange words of Merlin. And as he rode, suddenly Merlin himself stood before him. I come to bid you farewell, said the good enchanter, and to speak my last word of warning. Have good care of the sword Excalibur, and of the magic scabbard of it, and beware the evil woman who shall steal it from you. She who shall be the mother of the evil knight who shall strike you down upon the field of Camlan. Yet she shall be with you at the last, her evil purged away, and she with others shall bring you to Avalon. Of these others, the ladies of Avalon, one awaits me, even the Lady Nimue. She shall bury me in the earth while I yet live. May you not escape her by your magic arts? asked Arthur. Oh, Merlin, I would not lose you. Nay, it is my fate answered Merlin. It is to the glory of low grace, and for you. Now you must show your worth and stand alone. Then Merlin went on his way deeper and deeper into the forest, following the Lady Nimue. And they came to the land of Gwynedd, where Pant was king, and lodged in his castle. And on the morrow, before they went on their way once more, Merlin spoke with King Pant's wife, whose name was Elaine. You have a son, said he. Marvelous youth, whom the Lady of the Lake took from you when he lay in, in the cradle, so that he dwelt with her for many years. I would see this boy before I pass from the ways of men, for his name is Lancelot, and another Elaine in the times to be shall bear him one called Galahad, and these two knights shall be the best of all the round table, and the chiefest glory of the realm of low grace. And when Merlin saw Lancelot, he blessed him, and bade him ride to the court of King Arthur before the next feast of Pentecost, and asked to be made a knight, saying that it was Merlin's last wish, for he laid himself living in his own grave. And then, while King Pant and Queen Elaine and young Lancelot marveled at his words, Merlin departed from among them, and went away into the hills of North Wales, while Nimue went before him, playing upon the quith, the magic harp of Wales, and singing strange songs of weird and wonderful enchantment. At length they came to the place appointed, and there under the shadow of a fair white hawthorn covered in flowers, Nimue sat down, and Merlin laid his head upon her lap. Then, singing and playing, she wove a great magic round him in nine circles, round Merlin and round the hawthorn bush. Merlin slept and woke again, and now it seemed to him that he dwelt in the fairest tower in the world and the most strong. Lady, he said, you have taken from me all my magic, so that never may I come out of this tower. Stay but with me, and leave me not alone in these enchantments. I shall go forth before long, answered Nimue, for King Arthur is in great danger, and now that you may stand by him no longer, I must go to his aid. Morgana Le Fay is weaving her wicked spells to entrap him. I must leave you and go speedily, but first I will give you rest that you may sleep through many centuries, until the day dawns when you shall wake. Then, as if walking in his sleep, Merlin rose to his feet and went down a narrow stairway which opened in the ground before him. Down and down he went into a dark stone room beneath a great rock, and he laid himself upon a great slab of stone like a table and fell asleep. Then Nimue, by her magic, closed up the passage leading to the light, and went her way swiftly toward Camelot, leaving Merlin to rest in his dark tomb.
And there he lies until the day of his awakening, when the circle of low grace shall be formed once more in this island. But whether he rests in the magic forests of Brocaleanda, or in the Isle of Bards and Cornwall Crag, or beneath the wood of Bragdon, no one can tell until that day. <laughs> Meanwhile, Sir Arthur hunted in the mysterious forests of South Wales with Sir Uriens, his brother-in-law, the husband of Morgana Le Fay, and with the brave knight Sir Accolon of Gaul. Far and fast they followed a certain great heart, mile after mile, until they were quite lost in the forest, so fast that at length their horses fell dead under them, and still they followed that heart, for it was now so weary that it could hardly move. They came out from under the trees, down a grassy bank, and saw the heart fall to the earth and die. And then, looking round, they discovered that the bank sloped up to a great sheet of water, and that a small ship, all hung with rich silks, was drawing in beside the shore. The ship came right to them, running in against the sand so that they could step aboard, but there was no living thing to be seen anywhere upon that ship. Sirs, said King Arthur, let us enter this strange bark and dare the adventure of it. So they went aboard and found it a passing fair ship, very richly furnished and draped with rare silks. It was evening when they came down the bank to the waterside, and the night fell rapidly after they had stepped onto the ship, so rapidly that in a few minutes it was pitch dark. Then suddenly great torches appeared all along the bulwarks, so the decks were brilliantly lit. The ship moved across the still dark waters, while twelve fair damsels came out from the cabin and served them all the meats and wines that ever a man could desire. Sweet music played softly all the while, and the whole ship was fragrant with the heavy scent of strange flowers. The king and his two companions were weary after their day's hunting, and after they had supped and enjoyed the cool night air on the deck of that strange vessel, each of them was led below to a rich cabin prepared for him alone. And before long, each one of them was laid in a soft, comfortable bed, and that night they slept most marvelously deep. On the morrow, Urians woke to find himself at Camelot, in his own bed beside his wife, the enchantress Morgana Le Fay, and much he marveled how he came two days' journey during one night's sleep. His wife smiled deeply and mysteriously, a strange evil light glimmering behind her great dark eyes, but she said nothing of the matter, though well she knew. King Arthur, however, woke to find himself in a dark and dim, dismal prison, a damp, unwholesome dungeon beneath some great castle, and he heard in the darkness the groans of twenty knights who were also held there in cruel captivity. "'Who are you that so complain?' asked King Arthur, and one of them replied, "'We are twenty knights kept prisoner here, and there are some of us who have been here as long as eight years.' "'How did this happen?' asked Arthur." The lord of this castle, answered the knight, is an evil man called Sir Damas, who wrongfully holds the castle and lands from his elder brother, the good knight Sir Outlake, and he takes captive all those who come to the castle and shuts them in this miserable dungeon. As they were talking, there came a, there came a damsel bearing a lamp, and she said to King Arthur, What cheer, sir? I hardly know, he answered, nor can I tell how it came to be in this evil place. Sir, said she, you shall be set at liberty, and win the freedom of all these knights also, if you will but fight for my lord. For his brother will this day send a champion to do battle with him, and whoso wins shall become lord of all these lands. Now, said Arthur, you have set me a hard question. Your lord, Sir Damas, is an evil knight, and I would not strike a blow in his defense. Yet had I rather die in battle than linger to my death in this dungeon... If Sir Damas will release all those who lie imprisoned here, I will do battle to the death in his quarrel. It shall be so, said the damsel. Then I am ready, said Arthur, if I had but a horse and armor. You shall lack neither, she assured him. Do but follow me. They came up from the dungeon and out into the clear sunlight of the courtyard. Surely, damsel, I have seen you before, said King Arthur. Were you ever at King Arthur's court? No, answered the damsel. I never came there in all my life. I am but the daughter of Sir Damas, lord of this castle. But she spoke falsely when she said this, for she was one of the damsels who served Queen Morgana Le Fay. 
At the same moment that Arthur found himself in the dungeon beneath Sir Damas' castle, Sir Accolon of Gaul woke also from his charmed sleep and found himself lying in a pleasant courtyard, but at the very edge of a deep well, so that if he had moved but a little, he would have fallen into it and found his death many, many feet beneath. When Sir Accolon found where he was, he blessed himself and said, Now may God save King Arthur and King Uriens, for those damsels in the ship have betrayed us. Surely they were fiends and not women. If I ever escape from this adventure, I shall slay all who deal thus in black magic and wicked enchantments. <laughs> While he was thinking this, there came a dwarf with a great mouth and a flat nose and saluted Sir Accolon, saying, I come from your lady, Queen Morgana le Fay, and she greets you well as her dear love and begs you for her sight to fight for her this day with the strange knight. And for this she sends you King Arthur's own sword Excalibur, and its scabbard, and bids you fear not, but do battle to the death without any mercy as she has instructed you. She bid me also tell you that her husband lies dying, wounded to the death by a traitor's hand, and that you shall wed her and be king of Gore in his stead. I did indeed promise to fight for her, said Sir Accolon, and if you come truly from her, since you bear the sword Excalibur, all these enchantments must be of her doing, so that I might do battle against her unknown enemy and slay him. Sir, it is even as you say, answered the dwarf, and you will do well to fight in this battle. Then he drew Sir Accolon from the side of the well, and afterward led him to the hall of the castle, where Sir Outlake awaited him with six squires. When Sir Accolon had eaten and drunk, these armed him in strong armor, set him upon a mighty war horse, and led him to the field of battle, midway between the castles of Sir Outlake and Sir Damas, in a fair green meadow. Meanwhile, Sir six squires of Sir Damas had led Arthur to the hall of their master's castle, given him food and drink, armed him well, and led him out of the gate. As Arthur rode from the castle, another damsel came to him, bowed low, and said, Sir, your sister, my mistress, Queen Morgana le Fay, greets you, and she sends me to bring you your sword Excalibur, which you left in her keeping, for she hears that this day you must engage in battle. Here is the sword and the scabbard also, and my mistress kneels even now in prayer for your safety. King Arthur thanked the damsel, and went toward battle with a lighter heart now that he had his own sword and the magic scabbard, the wearer of which would never lose much blood, however sorely he was wounded. These two knights, King Arthur and Sir Accolon, in strange armor with closed visors and no devices on their shields to show who they were, met together in the green meadow, neither knowing the other. They jousted with their spears at first, so mightily that neither might sit his horse. Then they drew their swords and went eagerly to battle, smiting many great strokes. But always King Arthur's sword failed to bite as Sir Accolon's did. For Accolon's sword bit through King Arthur's armor at every stroke until his blood ran down and dyed all the meadow. But Accolon bled scarcely at all, though Arthur had wounded him once or twice. And when King Arthur saw his blood upon the grass, and felt how the sword in his hand bit not into the steel as it was wont to do, while Accolon's drew blood at every stroke, he felt that there had been some treason and black magic used to change the swords. For he became more and more certain that in Accolon's hand gleamed the true Excalibur. Now, Sir Knight, beware, for I am going to hit you again, taunted Sir Accolon. Arthur, without replying, struck so hard that he went staggering back. But Accolon struck once, and Arthur fell to the ground. He was soon up again, however, and they struck many more great strokes at one another. But always King Arthur lost so much blood that it was a marvel that he still stood on his feet, and only so brave a knight could have fought on while enduring such pain. At last the two of them paused to rest and all those who had gathered to watch the battle spoke well of them, but lamented that one of two such brave knights was doomed to die. And amongst those who watched was the enchantress, Lady Nimue of Avalon, she who had put Merlin under the stone, and who had arrived only after the battle had begun. This is no time for me to suffer you rest, exclaimed Sir Accolon suddenly, and thereat he came fiercely against Arthur once more. But Arthur, wild with rage and pain, whirled up his sword and smote Accolon so hard upon the helmet that he fell to the earth. But at that stroke, the sword broke to pieces in his hand, leaving only the hilt and the crossbar. Accolon sprang up again and rushed at King Arthur, who defended himself with his shield, though certain that now there was no escape. Knight, jeered Accolon, 
yield to you to me as craven and vanquished, or else I will smite off your head with my sword. Nay, said Arthur, I cannot so shame my vows. If it were possible for me to die a hundred times, I would rather that. For though I lack weapon, yet I shall I lack no honor. And if you slay me weaponless, it is you who will be shamed. I'll take the risk of that, cried Acalon. Run away now, for you're no better than a dead corpse already. He slashed at Arthur again, but the king took the blow on his shield and hit Acalon across the visor with the broken sword so hard that he staggered back three paces. And as he did so, Nimue by her magic loosened the scabbard at his side, so it fell to the ground in front of Arthur, who caught it up and buckled it to his belt. Acalon came on once more, struck a stroke that might have cleft Arthur's head to the chin, but Nimue waved her hand once more, and the sword twisted from Acalon's fingers and landed point downward in the ground. Arthur leaped forward, took the sword in his hand, and knew at once by the feel of it that it was his own Excalibur. Ha! he cried. You have been from me all too long, and you have done me great damage. And then to Acalon, Sir Knight, it is you who stand near to death. For this my own sword shall reward you well for the pain I have endured and the blood I have lost. Therewith he leapt at Sir Acalon, and smote him to the ground so hard that the blood burst out from his mouth and nose and ears, and he stood over him with Excalibur raised to strike, crying, Now will I slay you. Slay me, you well may, gasped Acalon, for never will I yield. I also vowed by my knighthood never to yield with life. Slay me, therefore since I will not live ashamed. You are a brave knight, and an honorable, said Arthur, lowering his sword. Tell me of what land you are, and who you serve. Sir, I am of the royal court of King Arthur, and Acalon of Gaul is my name. Tell me, who gave you the sword? asked the king, much dismayed, as he remembered the magic of the ship. Sorrowful sword it has been, said Acalon, for by it I have got my death. That may well be, said the king, but how came it into your hands? From Queen Morgana le Fay, answered Acalon sadly. I have loved her long, and she me, and I promised to fight and slay whom she would, even though it were off of the king, for which reason she sent me the sword this day, telling me her husband King Uriens was dead, and I should be king indeed if I conquered in this battle. But tell me, who are you that she would have had me slay? Oh, Acalon, said Arthur, do you not know that I am the king? When Acalon heard this, he cried out loud, Fair sweet lord, King Arthur, have mercy on me, for I knew you not. Mercy you shall have, answered Arthur, for I see that this battle was not your doing, but my sister's. Ah, Acalon, she has deceived me also by her beauty and her magic wiles. The good Merlin warned me, but I would not take warning. Now will I send her away from my court, or slay her if she bring any man to his death. Then King Arthur made peace between Sir Damas and Sir Outlake, and when he had done this, their squires carried him and Sir Acalon, who was even more badly wounded, to the abbey nearby in the forest, and Nimue came with them and tended on them. Sir Acalon died of his hurts before the next sun rose, but Arthur recovered slowly. Meanwhile, Queen Morgana le Fay, thinking him to be dead, was continuing at Camelot with her wicked plans. On the very day of the battle, she found her husband, King Uriens, lying asleep on his couch, and at once she called one of her damsels to her and said, Go fetch me my lord's sword, for I never saw a better moment than this wherein to slay him. Ah, madam, cried the damsel, do not do this thing. You will never escape if you murder your husband. That is no concern of yours, answered Morgana le Fay. This day I decree, have decreed that he shall die, so fetch me the sword quickly. Away went the damsel, but she sought out Prince Uwain first of all, and said, Sir, come quickly, and wait on my lady your mother, for she is just going to murder the king your father. I am fetching the sword for her to do it. Bring her the sword quickly, said Sir Uwain, or she will slay you also. With trembling hands, the damsel brought the sword to Morgana le Fay, who went swiftly to where King Uriens was sleeping. But as she raised the sword to strike, Sir Uwain sprang out from behind the hangings and seized her arm. Ah, fiend, he hissed. What wickedness are you at? Were you not my mother, I would kill you here and now. I think you are a devil and not a woman. 
Have mercy on me, begged Morgana. It was the devil who tempted me to this deed. The fiends of darkness are ever ready to lead astray those who know too much of their secret arts. You shall vow upon the holy sacrament never to attempt such a deed again, said Ewain. And to this oath, Morgana le Fay pledged herself. And a little while later, one of her damsels came to tell her that Acalon was slain, and King Arthur resting at the abbey in the forest. When he returns to Camelot, she thought, he will surely slay me for sli striving to bring about his death. I will go speedily from the court before he comes. Then she set out with her men-at-arms and her damsels, but she told Queen Guinevere that she was going riding in the forest. On her way, Queen Morgana le Fay came to the abbey, where Arthur lay recovering from his wounds, and suddenly she thought that now at least she could steal his sword Excalibur. The king lies sleeping in his bed, she was told, and gave command that no one was to wake him. I am his sister, answered Morgana very sweetly. Let me come just to watch by, watch by his side for a little while, there to pray for his speedy recovery. So they brought her where he was and left her with him. She found Arthur lying asleep with the sword Excalibur naked in his right hand, but the scabbard leaned against a table at his bedside. At least I can take this from him, she thought, and hiding it beneath her cloak, she went quick, quietly out of the abbey, mounted her horse, and rode on her way. Presently, King Arthur woke and missed his scabbard. Then he was very angry and asked who had been there while he slept, and they told him it was Queen Morgana le Fay. Alas, said Arthur, falsely you have watched me. Sir, they answered, we durst not disobey your sister's commands. Then Arthur called for horses, and he and Sir Outlake went galloping through the forest after Queen Morgana le Fay and her attendants. Before long they saw them, and the chase became fast and furious. Nearer and nearer came Arthur and Outlake, until at last she realized that there was no escape. She rode to a deep lake in the forest and threw the scabbard into the middle of it, crying, Whatever happens to me, I will at least make sure my brother never has his scabbard again. And it sank, for it was heavy with gold and precious jewels. After this, Queen Morgana led her followers into a valley filled with great stones. And by her magic, she turned herself and all of them into stones also, so that when King Arthur and Sour Outlake came among them a few minutes later, neither Morgana le Fay nor any of her people was to be seen. Here has been an evil magic, said Arthur, crossing himself, and when they had searched long and vainly for the scabbard, they rode back to the abbey and thence to Camelot, where Guinevere and all the fellowship of the round table rejoiced greatly to see them. But as they sat at meat in the great hall that evening, a damsel came in and bowed low before King Arthur. My lord, she said very humbly, I come from your sister, Queen Morgana, to beg her pardon of you for the wickedness that has been done. Never again after this day will she strive to hurt you, for the fiend has gone from her which tempted her to evil. And in token of her great love and true repentance, she sends you this mantle, the fairest in the world, and whoso wears it shall never suffer pain any more. When all saw the mantle, they marveled at it, for indeed it was passing fair, set all with precious stones and embroidered with gold and silver, and King Arthur was happy in the gift of the mantle, and put out his hand to take it. But the Lady Nimue, who had returned to Camelot with him, cried out suddenly, Lord King! Put not on the mantle until you know more of it. Let this damsel set it upon her olden shoulders, ere it come on yours or any others in this hall. It shall be as you counsel me, said King Arthur. Damsel, I would see the mantle upon you. Sir, she said, I am not worthy to wear a king's robe. Nevertheless, you shall wear this, commanded Arthur. And so perforce the damsel drew the mantle close about her. And immediately there was a bright burst of flame, and she fell to the ground, a heap of smoldering ashes. And after this, Queen Morgana le Fay never again dared enter the realm of Low Grace, but went to her own castle in the land of Gore and fortified it strongly. We take a break for a sec. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead a bit in the story of King Arthur into the tale of Lancelot and Elaine. So Lancelot is off uh, adventuring. He's, he's older now. He's become uh, the chief of the knights in the round table. And he comes upon a castle. <clears throat> Sire, said Lancelot, bowing gravely, I hold it a great honor that you should welcome me thus. And as for my name, it is Lancelot of the Lake. 
And I, answered his host, am Peles, king of the wastelands and of haunted Carbonek. But I hold a sacred trust, for Joseph of Arimathea was my ancestor, and anon you shall see a wonder. Lancelot seated himself at the table, and he noticed there was no food nor wine set before anyone there, and that a great silence had fallen upon them all. Then suddenly there was a peal of thunder. The door flew open, and into the hall came three women dressed all in white and veiled, moving so silently that he thought they must be spirits and not women. The first bore in her hand a spear with a point of light, from which dripped blood that vanished ere it touched the floor. The second held a golden platter covered with a cloth, and the third a golden cup covered also, but seeming to be filled with light so pure and bright that no man might look at it. But it was with a deeper awe and reverence that Lancelot hid his face in prayer as the procession passed round the table and out of the hall once more. When it was gone, a great peace and well-being fell upon all present, and it seemed to Lancelot that he had eaten and drunk of more than mortal food. My lord, he said in a hushed voice, what may this mean? Sir, answered King Peles, you have seen the most precious tokens in the world, and I, the descendant of Joseph of Arimathea, am their guardian. From that cup and platter our Lord Jesus Christ ate and drank at the Last Supper. With that spear, Longinus, the Roman centurion, pierced his side as he hung upon that cross. And in that same cup, which is called the Holy Grail, Joseph of Arimathea caught his most precious blood as it ran from the wound. No, I say, that the Holy Grail has passed by you beneath that cloth. When it passes amongst you all as you sit at Camelot, the royal table shall be broken for a season, as you all ride forth in quest of it. When the wonder of what he had seen had passed from Lancelot a little, he spoke to his host of other matters, and many days he remained at Castle Carbonek, but never again did he see the procession of the Holy Grail. And just so you know, he never sees it again because Lancelot ends up being unworthy of the Holy Grail. But King Peles had a daughter called Elaine, one of the fairest damsels in the world, and she loved Lancelot the moment that she saw him. All the time he was at Castle Carbonek, Elaine tended on him and served him in all things and tried her hardest to win his love. But though Lancelot treated her with all courtesy, rode hunting with her, listened to her singing, played at chess with her, yet still his heart was unstirred, and he remained faithful to Queen Guinevere, though unfaithful in thought at least to his honor, as a knight of low grace and to his king. Then Elaine spoke with her father, King Peles, and he who could see a little of the future as through a glass darkly made answer. Do not weep and lament, my daughter. Lancelot shall indeed be your lord, and you shall bear him a son, which shall be called Galahad, who shall bring the wastelands from under the shadow of the curse and heal me of my wound. I know not how this may come to pass, but that it will be so, have no fear. The days went by while Lancelot dwelt in peace at Carmenach, but Elaine prospered not at all in her love. At length, in despair, she turned aside to seek the aid of enchantments, and there came to her a damsel named Bryson, who was skilled in all the arts of which Morgana la Fay was queen. Ah, lady, said the damsel, know well that Sir Lancelot loves only Queen Guinevere, and no other woman in all the world. Therefore we must work by guile, if you would have him. After this they spoke together for a long time, and the end of it was that Elaine went secretly from Carbonek. Then there came a man to Lancelot bearing a ring, which seemed to him one that he knew well, which Queen Guinevere always wore. Where is your lady, the queen? asked Lancelot. Sir, answered the man, she is at Case Castle not many miles from here, and she bids you come to her as soon as may be. Then Lancelot bade a hasty farewell to King Peles, men mounted his horse and rode swiftly through the wastelands until Carbonek was lost behind him, and he came at sundown to the little castle of Case, on the skirts of the great forest, and there he found Queen Guinevere, or so it seemed to him, waiting for him with her eyes full of love. But really it was Elaine, who by the arts of Bryson, had taken the form of Guinevere for a little while in the dim glow of evening. When Lancelot saw her alone thus, he quite forgot his honor and his oath, the glory of Low Grace and his faith to King Arthur. All his thoughts were in Guinevere, 
and when she spoke to him of marriage, he forgot even that she was King Arthur's wife. Indeed, Bryce and the Enchantress had made all things ready at the castle of Case. The morning dawned grey and ominous, and Lancelot awoke to find the Lady Elaine sleeping by his side. Then he remembered all, and how he was shamed forever, even though Elaine and not Guinevere was beside him. Alas, he cried, I have lived too long, and now am dishonored. Then Elaine woke and knelt before him, confessing all and praying for his forgiveness. Ah, noble Sir Lancelot, she cried, I did all these things only for love of you. But Lancelot cried aloud in his agony of mind, and the world seemed to spin round him. Flinging open the window, he leaped out of it, clad only in his shirt, fell into a bed of roses, sprang to his feet all scratched and bleeding from the thorns, and rushed away, still crying aloud, until he was lost in the forest. And there he wandered, and upon the desolate hills of Wales, his wits quite gone from him. The month sped by, and at Camelot men began to ask what had become of Sir Lancelot that no one had seen for so long. Christmas came, and still he did not return, nor had he graced the feast at Pentecost or Michaelmas. When the new year was in, Sir Lancelot's cousin, Sir Bors de Ganis, went quietly away from Camelot in search of him. In time he came to the wastelands, and then to the mysterious castle of Carbonek, which so few men could ever find. Here he found King Peles and the Lady Elaine, and Elaine carried in her arms a newborn babe. Lo, Sir Knight, said Elaine, this is my son, and his father is Sir Lancelot of the Lake. Today this boy shall be christened, and his name is Galahad. Then Elaine told Sir Bors all the story of Lancelot's visit to Carbonek and Case, and of how he had run mad with shame and sorrow, and had wandered away into the hills of, uh, of Wales. At supper that night, the grail procession passed once more through the hall, but in place of the bleeding lance, the second ghostly maiden carried a golden candlestick with seven branches. "'You have seen a great wonder,' said King Peles, "'nor has this procession passed before the eyes of any, save Sir Percival and Sir Lancelot. High up in the room above the keep, those candles burn forever upon an altar in a little chapel, and the grail rests there, and the bleeding lance wherewith Longinus pierced our lord. I, the grail keeper, have entered that room, and my father before me, and his father, and so back to Joseph of Arimathea, who built this castle. But no other man has entered that room, save only the good knight Sir Gawain. Once another knight came there, and laid impious hands upon the lance. That was Sir Balin, who smote the dolorous stroke, and perished sadly for his sin. Go now, in search of Sir Lancelot. You will come here once more, but he, by reason of his sin, is not worthy to touch the grail, though in earthly matters he is the best knight in the world. Sir Bors rode away the next morning, and when he had come out of the wastelands, he met Sir Gawain and Sir Percival, Sir Ewain and Sir Segramore, and many other knights who were also seeking for Sir Lancelot. East and west and south and north they went, but never a trace of Lancelot did they find. Many adventures befell them on their quest, and many strange things did they see, but no one whom they met had seen a mad knight running through the land without armor or weapons. On a day, however, Sir Percival and Sir Bors drew near to the castle of Case, and there Elaine met them and greeted them joyously, for she had come away with Galahad from Carbonek, and now not even she could find it again. She entertained them well in her castle, but grieved sorely when she heard that Lancelot was still lost. For many days they remained at Case, hoping that Lancelot might come there in his wanderings, and at last he came. Elaine walked in the garden one day, and her little son Galahad came running to her suddenly, crying, Mother, come and look, I found a goodly man who lies sleeping by the well. And when Elaine beheld him, she knew that it was Lancelot, and weeping sorely, she hastened to Percival and Bors and told them, Do not wake him, they said, for perchance he is still mad and will slay you in his fury, or run wild once more. Then there came a hermit who dwelt in a little chapel nearby, and he counseled that Lancelot should be carried from the castle while still sleeping and laid therein. All night I will pray before the altar, said the hermit. It cannot be that the good knight Sir Lancelot shall pass all his days as a madman, wandering naked in the wilderness. 
Early next morning, Percival and Bors stood bareheaded in the doorway of the little chapel and saw the hermit kneeling before the altar while Lancelot lay like a dead man on a black bier in the little chapel. For long they stood there in the quiet shadow with bowed heads, praying also for Sir Lancelot, and then quite suddenly the Holy Grail was in the place, hanging in a great halo of light above the altar, shining so brightly that both the watchers sank on their knees and buried their faces in their hands. When they looked up again, Lancelot was kneeling too, but of the Holy Grail there was no sign, only the light of the rising sun shining down upon him through the little round rose window above the altar. When they had thanked the hermit, Sir Bors and Sir Percival led Lancelot back to the castle case, he walking like a man asleep, and he was laid in a bed and tended well by Elaine and her maid Bryson. But Sir Bors and Sir Percival rode back to Camelot, and told King Arthur all that they had seen. At length Sir Lancelot woke from his long sleep, his mind whole and untroubled once more, and found Elaine bending over him. Ah, me, he exclaimed. Tell me, for God's sake, where am I, and how came I thither? Sir, answered Elaine, into this country you came as a madman, wandering naked and without knowledge. In my garden you were found, and the madness was raised from you by the good offices of Nacians the divine hermit and by the coming of the Holy Grail. For many days after this, Sir Lancelot remained at Case, and Elaine tended him until he was strong and well again. But then, in spite of her tears and entreaties, he bade farewell to her, mounted his horse, and rode on his way toward Camelot. For still his heart turned only toward Queen Guinevere, and he loved her now with a greater, fiercer passion, even though Elaine had tricked him wearing her form, and had wedded him when he thought she was Guinevere. What became of Elaine after Lancelot had left her? The old tales do not tell, or tell confusedly. When Lancelot came again to Carbonek, Elaine was there no longer, and Galatad, almost from the day when Lancelot rode away from Castle Case, was entrusted to the care of certain holy monks and nuns who dwelt not far from Camelot. I'm going to skip just a little bit as we read some of the later parts. Here's just the beginning of Lancelot and Guinevere. The quest to the Holy Grail was ended, and all those knights who were left alive had returned to Camelot. King Arthur rejoiced greatly, greatly to see them sitting once more around the round table, but he was sad also, for he knew that the time was drawing near when the realm of low grace should be lost again in the darkness. But there was a change after the quest was over. Many seats stood empty at the round table, and now no new names grew in letters of gold upon these seats, for there were no new knights to take the places of those who were dead. Now, too, the evil which had never quite been rooted out of low grace began to stir once more, and in a little the fellowship and harmony of this court was to be broken. Yet for a little while the sun shone as brightly as ever, and only Arthur, who remembered the words of Merlin the Good Enchanter, knew that the end was near. Now that Sir Galahad was dead, Lancelot was once more the greatest knight in no Logres, and for a little time he was the noblest too, for he remembered how he had failed to achieve the Holy Grail by reason of his sinful love for Queen Guinevere. And the queen noticed that Lancelot avoided her now, and rode away from Camelot on every quest that was offered, and one day she sent for him. And uh, Lancelot and Guinevere end up having a bit of a tryst, and they get caught in it, and it ends in a civil war between Arthur and Lancelot, and Lancelot, uh, ex uh, not paying attention to what he's doing, kills uh, Sir Gawain's brothers, Kills one of them on purpose, and two he kills completely unarmed. Um, and they were sympathetic to his cause, um, but he kills them unarmed, which was very shameful, just standing there with no armor, no weapons. Um, and as a result, that turns Gawain to a desire for revenge upon Lancelot for killing his brothers. And Gawain was very close to Arthur. He was uh, Arthur's dearest, Gawain and Lancelot. And so this creates more and more conflict, and eventually, um, Lancelot uh, flees to France. So let's pick up where that was. 
I will never forgive my brother's death, interrupted Gawain passionately, and in particular the death of my brother Gareth. And now, said Lancelot, I must bid farewell to this dear land, and to the holy realm of Lograce, and go overseas into Armorica in the land of France. Be sure that in time I shall follow you there, cried Sir Gawain. Peace reigned in Britain for a little while after this, but it was a broken and troubled peace. Forever Sir Gawain brooded on his brother's deaths, and ever Sir Mordred stirred up hatred against Sir Lancelot. And at length so many knights sided with Sir Gawain that Arthur was forced to declare war on Sir Lancelot, and he gathered together a great army and went into France, leaving Mordred to rule Britain while he was away. They marched into Armorica to the castle of Benwick, where Lancelot had taken up his abode, and they remained there for a long while. And three times did Lancelot and Gawain fight together, and each time Lancelot overcame Gawain and wounded him almost to death. But it seemed now that Gawain was mad, for even when he lay desperately wounded, he ceased not to cry, Traitor knight! Coward! When I'm whole again, I will do battle with you once more, for never will I forgive you for Gareth's death. And never will I rest until one of us is slain. Meanwhile in Britain, Sir Mordred continued with his plots, and when he had won enough knights to his side, he announced that King Arthur had been killed in the French wars, and he persuaded the people to choose him as their king, and even had himself crowned at Canterbury. Then he seized Queen Guinevere and tried to force her to marry him, but she managed to escape from him and came to London. Then she sent messengers to find King Arthur, and meanwhile she and those who remained faithful to her retreated into the Tower of London and fortified it. Presently, Sir Mordred came and tried to force his way into it, but it was too strong. He tried to persuade Queen Guinevere to come out, but she answered him bravely, I would rather die by mine own hand than be wife to you. Then the Archbishop of Canterbury, the same who had crowned King Arthur so many years ago, and who is now a very old man, came and warned Sir Mordred. Do you not fear the vengeance of God? he cried. King Arthur is not slain, and you do great harm to the Queen and to all this land. Peace, you false priest, shouted Mordred, for if you anger me more, I will strike off your head. Sir, answered the Archbishop, if you leave not your sin, I will curse you with bell, book, and candle. Do your worst, cried Mordred. I care not for you or your curses. So the Archbishop left Sir Mordred and gathered all the clergy together and cursed Sir Mordred, putting him outside all the rites and blessings of the church. Then Mordred sought to kill the Archbishop, but he fled away to Glastonbury in Somerset, and there became a hermit at the abbey. Queen Guinevere's messenger had reached King Arthur by this time, and swiftly he, sa he marched to the seacoast with all his men and set sail for England. But Mordred was waiting for him at Dover, and a terrible battle had to be fought before he and his men could land. At length, however, they were all ashore, and then they charged the rebels and sent them flying over the downs, Sir Mordred leading the flight. When the battle was over, King Arthur found Sir Gawain, lying mortally wounded, for the last wound which Sir Lancelot had given him had broken out afresh. Alas, my beloved nephew, said King Arthur, kneeling beside him, here now you lie dying, the man whom I loved best in all the world, and now all my joy is gone, for you and Lancelot I loved best of all my knights, and I have lost you both. Ah, dear lord, said Gawain, all this is my doing. I've been mad of late, mad with wicked pride and anger. The noble Sir Lancelot had been with you, this war would have never come about. I forgive him now. Would that I had forgiven him sooner. Can he ever forgive me? Then Gawain asked for pen and ink, and he wrote a letter to Sir Lancelot. O oh, Lancelot, flower of all noble knights that ever I saw or heard of, I, Gawain, dying by your hand, and by a nobler man might no one be slain, beg your forgiveness. Come again, noble Lancelot, come with all the speed you may, for the realm of Logres is in deadly peril, and our dear Lord Arthur has need of you. This day we landed at Dover and put the false traitor Sir Mordred to flight, and by misfortune I was smitten again upon the wound that you gave me. And now I write this in the very hour of my death, and oh, I beg you, the most famous knight in the world, to come swiftly. Of me you will find only the grave. 
But come at once before Mordred can gather fresh rebels. Noble Lancelot, I salute you, and farewell. Then Sir Gawain died, and King Arthur wept at his side all the long night through. King Arthur and his army were encamped upon the field of Camlan not many days later, and scarcely a mile away, Mordred waited for him, with a great gathering of knights and men-at-arms who had thrown in their lot with him, choosing rather his easy and lawless rule than the high service of Arthur, the good king of Logres. After the Battle of Dover, Mordred had fled away defeated, then in very little while news came that he was marching into the west country, harrying all the lands of those who would not fight for him. Then Arthur marched swiftly toward Cornwall and Lyonnes, and came one night to Camlan, near where so many years before Merlin the Good Enchanter had brought him to receive his sword Excalibur from the Lady of the Lake. That night Arthur could not sleep, for he knew that on the morrow there would be a great battle in which many more of his knights would fall, and he feared that this would be the last of all his battles, which Merlin had foretold, when the realm of Logres should pass into the darkness. For already the Saxons, hearing of the strife and civil war, were pouring to the Britain from the north and east. For the first time since the Battle of Mount Baden twenty-one years before, and now there was no fellowship of the round table, ready to ride behind King Arthur at a moment's notice and drive out the barbarians wherever they might chance to land. And just a quick aside, the barbarians are the ones who wrote this. The, the, the people who wrote these stories and told these stories were themselves the Anglo-Saxons. Arthur tossed and turned upon his bed in the royal tent, until near morning he grew still, and then, neither sleeping nor waking, he beheld a strange thing, for suddenly it seemed to him that Sir Gawain, who lay buried in Dover Castle, came to him attended by a train of fair ladies. "'Welcome, dear nephew,' King Arthur said, or seemed to say. "'I thank God that I behold you alive, whom I thought was dead. But tell me when to come, and why attended by these ladies?' My dear Lord King, my very dear Lord King, Sir Gawain answered, or seemed to answer, all these are ladies in whose cause I fought when I was a living man, for ever I fought in righteous quarrels only, and for this cause God has been very merciful to me, and has sent them to bring me hither to warn you of your passing. For if you fight with Sir Mordred this day, both of you will fall, and the most part of your people also." But I come to warn you, by God's grace, not to fight this day, but to make a truce with Sir Mordred, whatever his terms, a truce for one month. For within a month Lancelot will come with all his noble knights, and you and he together will slay Sir Mordred and overcome all that hold with him. Then Sir Gawain and the ladies vanished away, and in a little while King Arthur rose from his bed and called to him Sir Lucan and Sir Bedivere. And when he had told them of how Sir Gawain had visited them, and what his counsel had been, he bade them take two priests with them, and go to make a month's truce with Sir Mordred. And spare not, added the king, but offer him lands and goods as much as you think reasonable. So they came to where Mordred was with his great host of a hundred thousand men, and they treated with him for a long time. And at last he agreed to have Cornwall and Kent to be his at once, and the rest of Britain after King Arthur's death. It was arranged that Arthur and Mordred were to meet midway between the two armies, each attended by fourteen men only. Then King Arthur gave orders to his men. If you see any sword drawn, charge fiercely, and slay that traitor Sir Mordred, for I do not trust him. And Sir Mordred spoke likewise to his army. If you see any sword drawn, come in and slay them all. I do not trust this treaty, and I am sure that King Arthur is eager to be revenged on me. So they met as had been arranged, and the agreement was drawn up and signed by both of them. Then wine was brought, and they drank together. But while this was happening, an adder came out of the heather, as evil as the serpent which tempted Eve, and stung one of Mordred's knights on the heel. When the knight felt himself stung, he looked down and saw the adder, and then, without thinking, he drew his sword and killed it. But when the two armies saw the light flashing on the drawn sword, a great shout arose from either side, and in a minute they were charging at one another across the field of Camlan. Alas, this unhappy day, cried King Arthur. Then he and Mordred leaped upon their horses and rode into battle. Never since that day in any Christian land has there been a sadder or more dreadful battle. 
There was rushing and riding and striking, and many a grim wound was given, and many a deadly stroke. And ever King Arthur rode in the heart of the battle, doing mighty deeds. And this time Mordred fought well also, and did not think of flight. But every man there fought only to kill, and thus the battle lasted through all that long day, and never ceased until all those noble knights were laid upon the cold earth. The evening fell, dark and ominous, and the dreadful hush of death spread over the battlefield. And King Arthur wept to see all his people slain, for he looked about him and could see only two of all his knights left alive, Sir Lucan and Sir Bedivere, and both of these were sorely wounded. O oh God, cried King Arthur, what has become of all my noble knights? Alas, that ever I should see this doleful day, but now I know that the end has come. Yet I would that I could find that traitor, Sir Mordred, the cause of all this sorrow and destruction. Then as King Arthur looked about him, suddenly he saw Sir Mordred, who stood leaning upon his sword among great heaps of dead men. Now give me my spear, said King Arthur to Sir Lucan, for yonder I see the traitor who has brought about all this woe. Let him be, my lord, answered Sir Lucan, for he is accursed. And moreover, if you can pass this unfortunate day, you should be right well avenged. And noble sir, remember your night's dream and what the spirit of Gawain told you. For God of his great goodness has preserved you through this battle. By his blessing you've won the field, for there are three of us, while Sir Mordred stands alone. If you leave him now, this wicked day of destiny is safely passed. Come life or death, cried King Arthur. I will do justice upon this man who has brought destruction upon the realm of Lograce. God speed you well, said Sir Bedivere. Then the king took his spear, Ron, in both his hands, and ran towards Sir Mordred, shouting, Traitor! Now is your death upon you! And when Mordred saw King Arthur, he ran at him with drawn sword. But the king smote Sir Mordred under the shield with the feint of his spear and ran him through the body. But when Mordred felt that he had his death wound, in his hatred and fury, he thrust himself forward upon the spear, and gripping his sword in both hands, smote King Arthur upon the head so hard that it cut through the helmet and deep into the head beneath. Then Sir Mordred fell to the ground and died screaming. But King Arthur fell without a sound, and Sir Lucan and Sir Bedivere came to him and raised him with difficulty between them, and so, by gradual stages, for they were both sorely wounded, they carried him to a little deserted chapel not far from the mysterious sea, where the mist lay red like blood in the last rays of the setting sun. And then Sir Lucan fell down and died, for the strain of lifting was more than he could stand with a mortal wound already tearing at his vitals. Alas, said the king, who had recovered from his swoon, this is a heavy sight to see this noble knight die for my sake, for he had more need of help than I had. And Sir Bedivere knelt by Sir Lucan and wept, for the two were brothers and had loved each other dearly. The sun had sunk, and now the moon flooded the field of battle with cold white radiance and grim shadows, and the mysterious waters were veiled in long bars of silver mist. Then King Arthur said to Sir Bedivere, Now leave your weeping and mourning, gentle knight for it is no avail, and my time is short. But now, while I am yet with you, you may do me one last service. Take my good sword Excalibur, and go up over yonder ridge, and there you will come to a dark lake in the mountain pass, and when you come there, I charge you, throw my sword into the water, and come back and tell me what you saw. My lord, answered Sir Bedivere, your commandment shall be done, and I will bring you word at once of what I see. So Sir Bedivere departed, carrying the sword Excalibur, and as he went he looked at the sword, admired the precious jewels in the handle, and said to himself, I throw this valuable sword into the water, no good will come of it, only harm and loss. So when he came to the dark lake in the mountain pass, he hid the sword among the rushes, and hastened back to King Arthur, saying that he had thrown it into the water. And what saw you there? asked King Arthur. Sir, answered Sir Bedivere, I saw nothing but the wind stirring the dark waters of the lake. Then you do not speak the truth, said King Arthur. Therefore go quickly and throw the sword far out into the lake. So Sir Bedivere returned again and took the sword in his hand. But again he thought what a shame it was to throw away such a noble sword. 
So he hid it once more and returned to the king. What saw you there? asked King Arthur. Sir, answered Bedivere, I saw nothing but the dark water stirred by the moaning wind. Traitor and liar, cried King Arthur, now you have betrayed me twice. Who would think that I had loved you so well, and that you had been so noble a knight of the round table, when now you would betray your king for the value of a sword? Go again swiftly and do my bidding, for this long waiting puts me in danger of my life, and I grow cold in this chill night air. Then Sir Bedivere was ashamed, and he ran swiftly over the brow of the hill to the dark lake in the pass in the mountains. He came to the waterside, took the sword in his hands, and flung it far out from the shore as he could. And as the blade flashed away in the moonlight, there came a hand and an arm up out of the dark waters, the arm clothed in shining white samite, mysterious and wonderful, and caught the sword by the hilt. Three times it brandished the sword on high, and then vanished with it beneath the water, and the lake grew dark and still once more. So Sir Bedivere came back to the king and told him what he had seen. Now help me thence, said King Arthur, for I greatly fear I have tarried here too long. Then Sir Bedivere supported the king down the grassy slope, where the dew glimmered like magic diamonds in the moonlight, and they came to the shore of the mysterious sea, and then out of the white list came a barge as if to meet them, and in it were many fair ladies, all veiled in black, and among them was Nimue, the Lady of the Lake, and the Lady of the Isle of Avalon was there also, and Queen Morgana le Fay, Arthur's sister, and a sad low cry rose from among them when they saw King Arthur. Now place me in the barge, said King Arthur to Sir Bedivere, and so he did as he was commanded, and the three ladies received him tenderly, and laid him down with his head resting in the lap of the Lady of the Isle of Avalon. And then Queen Morgana le Fay, who knelt at his feet, wept softly and said, Ah, oh, my dear brother, why have you tarried so long from us? Alas, the wound in your head has caught over much cold. Then the barge moved slowly out from the land, and Sir Bedivere stood alone upon the shore and cried aloud, my dear lord, King Arthur, what should become of me now that you go and leave me here alone? Comfort yourself, answered King Arthur, and do as best you may, for you remain to bear word of me to those who are yet alive, for I must go into the Vale of Avalon, there to be healed of my grievous wound. But be you sure that I will come again when the land of Britain has need of me, and the realm of low grace shall rise once more out of the darkness. But if you ne hear never more of me, pray for my soul. Then the barge floated away into the mist and was lost to sight. But a strange low cry of mourning came over the waters until the sadness passed from it and was lost in a quiet whisper beyond the distance. Thanks for listening. There is an epilogue to that book, just so you know. It's a fun book to pick up, fun book to read, lots of stories in it. I hit more of the meta plot elements. A lot of it tells about just the adventures of the night. Uh, the nights. We'll see you next time.